last week, we were talking about uh, fixing our minds on things that are pure, lovely, good report, as uh, Philippians 4.8 uh, was talking about, and then acting on those things, and then having God's peace. So we were talking about having the mind of Christ, and I want to continue on that theme. In Revelation chapter 6, we see the sixth seal, which happens right before the seventh seal. The seventh seal is the coming of Jesus. Some things happen right before that. And we're going to start with uh, Revelation 6, verse uh, 12. I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth. The moon became as red as blood. Okay, can anybody tell me what earthquake that's talking about? What? We is Lisbon. Lisbon earthquake, right? Very good. Do you know the year? 1755. Lisbon earthquake, 1755. Very good. I don't have much remembrance of that. I was only a baby then. But uh, then after that, it talks about the sun became as dark as black cloth and the moon became as red as blood. 1833. Uh, not quite. You, I, I, it's funny because this morning I asked the same question in Plant City and somebody said 1833. That is the next uh, sign. Okay? That's the next sign. The, uh, does anybody know when the day of darkness was or what's called the dark day that this is talking about? It was in New England, May 19. 1780 okay was the dark day all right uh, then uh, in verse 13 then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind and when was that Wally you just said it 1833, it's right. 1833. All right. Then in verse 14, it says, <clears throat> The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and they cried to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to survive or as the king james version says who will be able to stand who will be able to live all right so this is explaining the second coming People are asking for rocks and stones to fall on them and hide them from the one who died for them. I think that's pretty sad. I sure hope that's not going to be me. Right? And yet the question is asked, who will be able to survive? Who will be able to live through this? Well, before going to the seventh seal, Revelation takes a time out in chapter 7 to answer this question. Who will be able to stand when he appears and survive? Revelation 7 answers the question, and we see specifically here in verse 3 of Revelation 7, it says, wait, don't harm, <coughs> sorry, wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. All right, so those who are able to stand when he appears 
and not ask for the rocks and stones to fall on them are the ones who have the seal of God in their foreheads. And oftentimes we talk about the seal of God being the Sabbath, and it is, but it, it's, it's more than that. The Sabbath is the law of God. The seal of God is his character, and his character is others first. And of course, the Sabbath teaches us to put others first. It teaches us to put God first. And then it also says that nobody... Uh, in our family or even within our gate should be working on the Sabbath. So it means to put your family and friends first too. Give them a break. Put God first. Put your friends and family first. That is the seal of God. Others first. Amen. And those who are ready when he returns are those who have the seal of God in their forehead, which means they have the character of God, the attitude of God in their mind. Others first. Have we ever seen this? In 1973, in Adelaide, Australia, 11-year-old Joanne Ratcliffe was at an Australian rules football game with her family. They had season tickets. And for a few years, they had season tickets uh, along with another family that they had met at the game simply because their seats were next to each other year after year. And that family had a five-year-old daughter named Christy. Well, at a game in 1973, it's nearing the end of the match, and five-year-old Christy needs to go to the restroom. So... The family tells Joanne, 11-year-old Joanne, take her to the restroom. Don't let her out of your sight. So Joanne and Christy go to the restroom and sadly were never seen again. I say they were never seen again. Actually, afterwards, witnesses came forward and said that they saw a man carrying a five-year-old little girl and with what looked to be an 11-year-old girl fighting him, and he kept trying to fight her off. And then years later, another witness came forward that said that they saw him, you know, a couple of blocks away from the stadium. They weren't even at the stadium. And they saw a man carrying a five-year-old girl and a little girl trying to, you know, get the five-year-old free. All of the witnesses, of course, said the reason they didn't think anything of it at the time was it just looked like a father trying to control his kids who were out of control. And so as the investigation went on since 1973, they've had suspects. They have never been able to arrest anybody in the case. They I have never seen Christy or Joanne again. Of course, they're presumed dead. But in one of the documentaries that I was watching, at the end of the documentary, it made someone made the comment that Joanne's family can at least know that she died being faithful to her charge. She was told, do not let Christy out of your sight. And she stayed faithful to that charge, even to her death. She was putting other people first. I believe that is the seal of God. Amen. Others first. I was uh, talking with Diane a while back about Marion Fisher in Pennsylvania, where Diane Fisher comes from. I think you believe there's some kind of a relation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. In uh, 2006, a crazed gunman went into an Amish school building and was going to and did end up shooting. And so, of course, the Amish don't have telephones, so the teacher had no choice but to run and get help. While she's running to get help, 13-year-old Marion Fisher is standing there, and she realizes that this man is going to start shooting before help arrives. Not everybody's going to get saved. 
Now put yourself in 13-year-old Mary Fisher's shoes. You realize not everybody's going to be saved. What's the first thing you're going to do? 13-year-old Marion Fisher went to the gunman and said, shoot me first. To buy time for the other children. And of course, I'm thinking, if I was that gunman, that would break my heart and I would just stop what I was doing. Right? No, no. He shoots her first. And she died. Other children that had been shot were taken into different hospitals. And several of them required surgery. And as they were coming out of surgery in different hospitals in different parts of town, they were all telling the same story about Marion Fisher. I believe Marion Fisher died with the seal of God, which is others first. And it's interesting, by the way, at her funeral, the funeral of the others, that they didn't really... They didn't praise Marion Fisher. The Amish didn't praise her for what she did. The, the Amish do not praise the dead. But also when I heard about that, I was also thinking, yeah, she's a hero in my mind, no doubt. But when I heard that the Amish don't praise the dead and weren't praising Marion Fisher for what she did, I couldn't help but think of a parable that Jesus told when he said, you know, if a master comes into the house and sits down and the, the servant has prepared his dinner and the master sits down and the servant serves him his dinner, is the master going to go on and on and thank him for what he did? No, he was only doing what he was supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus tells all of us, if you're follow me, pick up your cross, get ready to die, come die with me. Friends, Marion Fisher was only doing what she was supposed to do. Put other people first. Friends, nothing less is asked of you and me. If anyone would be my disciple, let him pick up his cross daily. And follow after me. That is the call for all of us. There in Luke 9.23. And so we see the seal of God. Is thinking. That's why it's in the forehead. Because those with the seal of God. Are thinking the way that God thinks. And God is always thinking. Others first. Let's take a look at Philippians. Chapter 2. Beginning with verse 1. It says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Verse 3 Don't be selfish. All right? There's something contrary, totally contrary to worldly thinking, right? Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. You know, when we're trying to impress other people, that's where all the unrest and anxiety comes from. Right? God didn't put us on this planet to compare ourselves to each other. He didn't put us on this planet to impress each other. He put us on the planet to love him and one another. Life is not supposed to be a competition. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Now who wants to do that today? Think of other people as better than you. But the, the neat thing is, you know, I enjoy learning. 
And I learn from other people when I realize I'm a student. And I realize they have something to teach me. And it doesn't matter how old they are. I, I'm 55 years old. Okay? Somebody might be 20 years old. They might be 15 years old. They have things I can learn from them. Because you know what? Even though I have 55 years of experience, I don't have 55 years of their experiences. They have 15 or 20 years of experience that I don't have. So yes, there is something I can learn from them. And I like learning. Learning is what makes life fun. And, and so the key is to always see ourselves as the student. Never to think that we're the one here just to teach everybody else. We need to be humble. We need to see ourselves as students trying to learn, being humble, thinking of others as better than ourselves. Verse 4, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Verse 5, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Or as the King James Version says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're to have the same attitude, the same thoughts that Jesus had. We're to be thinking his thoughts. In verse 6 it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross, or as the King James Version says, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, what does that mean, that he was obedient even to death? Not just any death, but the death of the, on a cross. What does that mean? Well, Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23 tells us that if somebody is hung on a tree, suspended above the earth, they're cursed of God. What does that mean? That means there's no hope of salvation for them. This is what happened to the five kings in Joshua chapter 10. These five kings had heard all about Israel's God before Joshua and the children of Israel got to the land of Canaan. They had heard about all the miracles and how they were freed from the Egyptians. And they had all that time to accept Israel's God as their God. But when Joshua and the Israelites got to Canaan, these five kings said, no, we're not going to accept Israel's God. We'll band together. We'll fight Joshua. We can overtake him. So they rejected God. That was the close of their probation. Joshua then kills the five kings, hangs each king on a tree. What did he mean by hanging each king on a tree there in Joshua 10? What he was saying is they had their probation, they've rejected God, there is no hope of salvation for them. For them, it is goodbye to death, goodbye to life forever. This is what Jesus was experiencing on the cross. When we talk about Jesus being obedient even to death on the cross, meaning he was obedient to the point of giving up his hope of salvation. When he was on the cross crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had always called God his Father. I and my Father are one. I always do those things that please my Father. In my Father's house are many mansions. He always called God his Father, except when he was on the cross, being treated the way we deserve, so we can be treated the way he deserves, he could not call God his father. And he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he wasn't crying out, why have you forsaken me till Sunday morning? You don't forsake somebody when you leave them for half the weekend. You forsake somebody when you leave them forever. 
And at that point, Jesus felt the separation was going to be eternal. But he was obedient, even to the point of giving up his hope of salvation. That is how faithful he was. Those who have the mind of Christ and the seal of God will also be obedient, even to the point if it costs me eternal life. Now, I know many people want to be obedient so they'll have eternal life. How many of us, like Jesus, are willing to be obedient even if it means losing it? I can think of one. His name is Moses. In Exodus 32, the children of Israel worship this golden calf. And Moses is trying to intercede. And he's trying to save his people. He's also trying to save God's honor. God's ready to wipe them out, or at least that's what he's telling Moses. And Moses is like, well, wait a minute. If God, if you wipe the children of Israel out, then it's going to look like you weren't able to deliver them and you're going to get a bad rap. So there in verse 32 of Exodus 32, Moses tells God, if you can't forgive their sin, then just take my name out of the book of life. What Moses is saying is, I would rather die for all eternity than for you to be dishonored. I would rather die for all eternity than to not honor and obey you. That's others first. That's the seal of God. That is the mind of Christ. Others first. The children of uh, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, told Nebuchadnezzar, God can save us from that fiery furnace, but we want you to know even if he doesn't save us, we're still not going to bow down to your image. It wasn't about making sure they got to live forever. It was making for sure that they were faithful to God. Their motivation was love, not a hope of reward, not a fear of punishment. Now, it's very encouraging because in Revelation chapter 15, you know, we, we think about, you know, what a cold world it is and how selfish people are. But friends, God has wonderful people. God has his people all over the place. And that's one of the things when I went on my mission trip to Peru, when I go other places to hold seminars, I see that God has his people all over the place. And in Revelation 15, we see a multitude of people standing on the sea of glass who sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. What do Moses and the Lamb have in common? Songs, you know, are about experiences. So if they're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, what experience do Moses and the Lamb both have in common? And we just spoke about it. Moses, like Jesus, was willing to say goodbye to life forever if that's what it took to honor God. He loved God more than they loved their own life. They hated sin more than they hated death. Now we see in Revelation 15 an entire multitude of people who have the same experience as Moses and the Lamb they are all more than happy to die for eternity if that's what it takes for them to express their love and faithfulness to God. There's a multitude on the sea of glass who have the seal of God, which is his character, which is others first. So how, how do we get the mind of Christ? Well, Let's take a look in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4.
Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at his right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. All right, so this is something we have to intentionally do. It says, set your thoughts. Okay, so we have to program ourselves. We have to, again, like we were talking last week, we have to be very intentional in our thinking. And we have to set our minds on heavenly things, not earthly things, not things that, that aren't even going to matter next year or, or even next week. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our day-to-day -day living, something happens and we think, oh, that ruined my day. Well, did it really, was it really a terrible day or was it just a really bad five minutes that you thought about all day? You see, not only that, but what is it going to matter tomorrow? We need to be thinking about things that, that matter. Things that matter for all eternity. You know, a lot, we see a lot of political unrest right now. And when I see that political unrest, instead of getting wrapped up in all of that, I think to myself, I am so glad that I am not a citizen of this earth. I am so glad that I am only here as a missionary. My home is in heaven. I'm here as a missionary. My home is in heaven. And that's the way that Christ thought when he said, my kingdom is not of this earth. My kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom should not be of this world either. Our kingdom should be in heaven. And that's where Paul tells us here to set our mind on those things. All right, let's take a look now at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So friends, we can't offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God without first letting God change our minds. Because as we were talking last week, the body is going to react to what the mind is thinking. Our actions are going to follow our thoughts. And that's why, again, we have to be so intentional with our thoughts. That's why if, if I think something bad about somebody, I have to tell myself to stop. You know, I, I was talking last week about the fact that in the past when I've gone on long road trips by myself, I'll be driving in the car and my mind is just... Wondering, you know, as I'm driving mile after mile, hour after hour alone. And sometimes my mind will just start drifting to something that happened 20 years ago when somebody did something that made me angry. And I'm just thinking to myself, that wasn't right. I'm getting angry about it all over again like it just happened today. And then I have to catch myself and tell myself, change the channel. Because here is the thing, 
I can also think about good things that people have done for me over the years. Well, on the closet. Exactly, exactly. And that's what Ellen White tells us, mm -hmm. is to cultivate the habit of thinking well of other people. Amen. And there are good things that we can think about other people. And I can think about Christ on the cross. And here's the thing that I've learned is I cannot think bitter thoughts about other people while I am at the foot of the cross. While I am looking by faith, contemplating the cross, I can't feel bitter towards other people. Number one, I know I have my own problems. I know there could very well be somebody driving down the highway right now thinking, I can't believe William did that 20 years ago. Or I can't believe William did that last week. There are people that can think bad of me very easily. So I know I need grace just as much as everybody else. But also when I look at the cross, I find that there is grace and forgiveness for me and everyone. And I cannot think about the cross and feel bitterness towards other people. I just simply have to change the channel. And we have to do that consciously sometimes. By changing the way that we think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. When we are thinking bad things about bad people, we are glorifying Satan. When we are thinking good things about people and talking about good things about people, we are glorifying God, who is the source of all goodness. Amen. There in uh, Matthew 5, Jesus says, Let men see your good works, that they may glorify your Father in heaven. We don't get the glory, he gets the glory. So when we're thinking good of other people, we're glorifying, <coughs> sorry, when we think good of other people, we're glorifying God. And friends, again, God has his wonderful people all over the place. And I know he certainly has them here in Homosassa. And we can be thinking good of other people. We can appreciate the cross and by doing that, it will help us to have the mind of Christ. Let's take a look now at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. All right. In the King James Version, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. And so that, again, shows me that we have to be very intentional with our thoughts. Prepare. When we prepare, we're very intentional, right? We don't leave anything to chance. Prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Now, self-control, that sounds kind of legalistic, doesn't it? That sounds kind of like it's me doing it. No. Self-control, we find in Galatians 5.22, is the fruit of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us self-control. The Holy Spirit isn't going to control and manipulate us. God is never going to turn us into robots. God doesn't want robots loving him because a robot can't really love. God wants us to love on our own because we choose to. Because we're exercising self-control. Now, self-control is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Satan is the one who wants us trapped in sin so that sin manipulates us, he manipulates us, and we become his robots. 
Jesus frees us from being robots by giving us our own self-control back so that we can make choices on our own. I remember about four years ago or so, I was uh, teaching a Bible class in the fifth and sixth grade classroom at Tampa Adventist Academy. And that lesson that particular day was on the lost uh, sheep and the lost coin, like we talked about here a couple of weeks ago. And so I started off the class uh, discussion by asking them, have you ever lost something and then God helped you get it back? This little boy raises his hand and says, uh, yeah, my uh, Nintendo set. I lost it and God got it back for me. I thought, okay, good. Somebody else raises their hand, my favorite book. I was on vacation and I lost it, but, but God found it for me. And then a, a young girl raises her hand and I said, what did you lose that God found and got back for you? She goes, my self-control. <laughs> I thought, wow, she gets it. <laughs> you know? That God gave her her self-control. And so self-control is a gift from God. It's self-control because, again, he doesn't want us to be robots. He wants us to choose to follow him. And we're to prepare our minds for action, exercise self-control, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So friends, we have the mind of Christ by thinking heavenly thoughts, by putting our priorities in order, as Christ did, by not thinking according to this world, by letting God change the way that we think, and also by preparing our thoughts, thinking the right thoughts. Because again, our actions will follow our thoughts. And that's why it's very important that we, when we talk well of others, it's by beholding we become changed. When we see good in others, we want to do that. When we're thinking about evil things people have done, then it makes us want to be vengeful and hurtful. And, and we can't have the seal of God with thoughts like that. And more importantly, or just as importantly, we can't have the peace of God while we're thinking thoughts like that. We have to be able to think God's thoughts in order to have God's peace. And that has to be very intentional. In uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, we were talking about this earlier, and, and this shows us again how Jesus was thinking in his prayer life. And, you know, when we're praying to God, we're thinking. And when we're praying the way Jesus would pray, we're thinking the way Jesus would think. And, of course, one of the ways that he prayed here uh, when he's in Gethsemane is a very unselfish prayer. Also, the Lord's Prayer gives us a model of a very unselfish prayer. Notice Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say, give me my bread. Forget everybody else, just make sure I've got bread. No, Jesus doesn't pray that. He says, give us our daily bread. Jesus prays, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sinned against us. Notice Jesus didn't pray, forgive everybody else for their sins. But as you know, Father, I have never sinned. No, Jesus doesn't think like that. Very humble. His prayers, his thoughts are always centered on others. And so it's very much so here in verse 39, here in Gethsemane, where it says he went a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, 
Let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Those are God's thoughts. Those are Jesus' thoughts. Not my will, but your will. Those are the thoughts that we can think when we pray. And you might think, well, that's not what I, I don't really mean that. Well, I've learned again that you can train yourself to feel what you say. You know, we were talking last week about the fact that there are people that lie to themselves and they believe their lies. Okay? Because they, they just tell themselves so many times that they start believing it. Well, you know what? I can start telling myself that I'm thinking unselfishly, and then before you know it, I'll actually be thinking unselfishly. Because we train ourselves. We have to change the way that we had previously been thinking, and that again is done by the grace of God. I want us to close here with uh, John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, John the Baptist's disciples are very jealous of the fact that Jesus is now getting more attention than he is and more attention than they are. And so <laughs> John the Baptist explains to them in verse 29 John the Baptist says, It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear all his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. And again, here is where we change our thinking. We, we set out in the world, we encourage young people to be successful. What do you want to be in life? You want to be president. That's great. You go for it. You get that. You become president. But you know what? Instead of asking our young people what they want to be, we need to ask them, what do you want to accomplish? You know, if I want to make health care affordable for everybody, I don't have to be president to do that. If I want to end world hunger, I don't have to be president to do that. Life isn't about having a label. It's not about having a position or a title over other people. It's not about being. It's about doing. And the fact is, we don't need a title to help people. We don't need a position to be able to make a difference in somebody else's life. John the Baptist was willing to step back and make other people successful. That's where he got his joy, was at other people's success. Are we like that today? Do, do we enjoy seeing other people succeed? I hope so. I, I think so. You know, years ago, uh, one of my family's favorite TV shows was the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And we always enjoyed watching that on Saturday nights with popcorn, apples, cheese. And don't tell anybody, but some of us also drink Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and... So we were big fans of Mary Tyler Moore. Well, if, if you know about Mary Tyler Moore, the Mary Tyler Moore show, you know that there were two other series that, that came from that. Mary Tyler Moore was very helpful to Valerie Harper and Cloris Leachman in getting their own TV shows. She wanted to see her fellow actresses succeed. And she encouraged them. She even paved the way for them. She wasn't just thinking of herself. She wanted to see other people succeed. And, and I just think about that today, even as, again, we look at the entertainment world. You know, something I've noticed back when I was a kid and Johnny Carson was on. Johnny Carson would uh, have a night off and he would have a guest host. Well, I've noticed now, whenever there's a, a late uh, 
night host that takes the day off, they don't have a guest host. They show reruns. And I can't help but wonder why that might be. Are they afraid? Are they intimidated by a guest host? Are they afraid of somebody else succeeding? We should want everyone to succeed. And so in verse 30, John the Baptist says, He, Jesus, must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. And friends, that totally changes our thinking from the way this world thinks. He must become greater, I must become less and less. And as we think of magnifying God, putting God and others first, and making ourselves less and less, we take on the mind of Christ. We take on the seal of God. And when Christ returns, we won't be asking for rocks and stones to fall on us and hide us from the one who died for us. We will be saying, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will save us. Friends, my prayer is that we will think the thoughts of Christ, that we will have the seal of God, that we will be ready when he returns. Amen. Are there any thoughts, comments, or questions about what we've studied today? Jean. Well, sometimes, you know, you're saying about thoughts, and you should always think better of other people. But sometimes when you're driving, and people pull in front of you or cut you off, you're not thinking very good of them. <laughs> At that moment, you can't control what comes into your mind. Well, again, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building the nest. <laughs> right? And I know exactly what you're talking about. I know that there, there have been times that somebody's tried to run me off the road and I wasn't vengeful. I was just trying to teach them a lesson. <laughs> I was just trying to be a teacher, but uh, you know, that's even put me in positions where I thought later that was very dangerous and I was putting my life at risk to prove a point, you know? So, yeah, we, we've all been there, and we, we, we've got, well, I remember one time when I was at a hospital visiting, and I came down the elevator to the first floor, and the elevator opened, I start to go off, and about 15 people rush on the elevator, and about run me over. I think maybe I was talking about this last week. And uh, the first thing I thought was, you let me off first, you know? And then I thought later, well, William, you don't know. They might be in their hurry to see somebody before they die. I don't know. So I just let them run me over. And I survived and went on and lived the rest of my life. Right? Uh, Ed and, and then uh, Brad. Yeah. I, um, I know you're not supposed to praise the preacher, but I'd just like to make an observation. And I want to say that I'm happy... Pastor William, that you're here in this church and that you're honest with us and that most of all you're honest with yourself and I, I know you, you spend a lot of time beholding Jesus and uh, I see a reflection of that in you and I'm, I'm thankful for it. Well, praise God. Again, Amen. God gets all, all the glory. Because Amen. Amen. Uh, if, if you were just seeing me, it wouldn't be pretty. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Like I say, there, there are people that can be driving down the road thinking about bad thoughts about me just as easily as I can think bad thoughts about them. But by God's grace, we can all think well of each other. Thank you. Brad?
Sometimes four-year-olds can put us in our place. <laughs> that, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. God uses four-year-olds, that's for sure. Gina? When you're talking about the Lord's Prayer, when you say that, when you say it by yourself, when you're by yourself, do you say, uh, do you use the me or do you use the I? First of all, uh, that's a good question, and I mean, to answer that practically, I don't really pray the Lord's Prayer to myself, uh, or when it's just me, uh, but I'm thinking, too, when I'm praying, I'm not just asking God to provide for me, I'm asking God to provide for everybody, right? right? And so I think it would be the same thing. You know, asking God to provide for everybody, not just provide for me. That, that's a that's a good question. Right. Huh? I just I was sitting here thinking. I pick on you a lot. I kneel to you a lot, but you're always there, and I appreciate that. And I just want to echoes echo Eddie's comments. I just thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you all for having me. It's a privilege to be here. I, I thank God that I'm here. Yes. I thank God that you all are here too. Right? Anybody else? All right. Uh, well, thank you all for worshiping with me today and uh, for being here. And let's, our closing song just remember our closing song is 311 I would be like Jesus between me and you while we are absent from each other. God bless you.